Okay, and welcome back to the Explaining History podcast, everybody. Um, I am delighted to be joined today by Barbara Savage, who is the Geraldine R. Siegel Professor of American Social Thought at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, today, we are talking about Mers Tate, um, an African-American scholar of diplomacy and international relations, who in an era of intense discrimination, uh, racial and gender discrimination, managed to become um, one of the, the kind of the, the outstanding figures in her field and whose work shaped um, the study of American diplomacy, but also American diplomacy itself in the 20th century. Um, a fascinating figure, but also um, a way of shining a light on um, racial and gender politics and discrimination. So firstly, Barbara, thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for all of your good work um, spreading the word on history. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So firstly, perhaps we can talk a, a bit about the work uh, of um, researching Mers Tate and writing about her. What what drew you to this? Where what was what what brought you to this? Well, I have um, had a vague familiarity with Tate's name just because I'm a scholar of 20th century African American history, and so even people who are not well known will you know will pop up in research. And um, the short story is that I was looking for something else. I was looking for materials on African-Americans who were serving as missionaries in the 20th century. And in the modern age, that means that when you go to begin that data search, um, you can put in certain terms and things pop up. And so what popped up was Merz Tate's name, not because she had done work on African-American missionaries, because she had not, but Mm. because she had done work on on American missionaries who had gone to Hawaii in the 1820s, beginning the long period of of American presence um, there. And once I saw that, um, and she popped up in part because her work was in the Journal of Negro History, now the Journal of African American History, Mm -hmm. which was one of the few places that Black scholars of her generation could get published regardless mm-hmm. of the fact that her work actually had ostensibly, ostensibly very little to do with African-American history. Her focus was someplace else. Mm-hmm. And once I found this article and began to read it, it was really stellar scholarship. I then started to look for more of her work. And again, that was revealed to me, as you say, she was a really prolific a diplomatic historian concerned about anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, uh, and U.S. imperialism, but also an extraordinary biography. And so it really began because I, I was trying to answer the, the question, who is this woman? Because th- her biography revealed herself to be uh, even more fascinating or as fascinating uh, as her work in that she was a, 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 a Black woman born into a family in rural Michigan in 1905, a, a fairly mm-hmm. unusual place for black um, for, for for black people at that time, mm-hmm. and from there she was able to imagine a life for herself, um, including an early ambition to become first a history teacher, which she did for many years, and then to become a scholar because she wanted to write and research. And so you see someone born in 1905 graduates from college in 1927, uh, itself an unusual accomplishment for for Black women, and then through a a whole uh, interesting twist and turns, ends up at Oxford in the 1930s, um, Mm -hmm. 1932 to 1935. And from there, uh, she earns a graduate degree in international relations. Again, uh, an unusual accomplishment for a woman, at that time, there were very few people, women at Oxford in that period, and certainly she was, in fact, the only Black um, American woman there during the time she was there. Uh, and from that, she comes back to the United States and 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 begins teaching, but then gets a, a doctorate in government from uh, from Harvard in 1941 then joins the faculty at Howard in 1942, where she spends the rest of her academic career. Now, I say that by way of of, of responding, I guess, to your 
opening about how unusual that all of that was during the period of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. uh, segregation and discrimination, both on the basis of race um, and sex. And so that's what drew me to her was mm -hmm. both the unusual biography and the extraordinary work. And I'm happy to say both about say more about both of those. How do we explain uh, this? Uh, I mean, is it simply that, you know, within every structure of discrimination, there are outliers, flukes, accidents, or was there was there a sort of like a means by which she was uh, she was able to um, uh, she was able to move forward in life? It's a combination of the one, the strength and power of her own mind. She was a brilliant uh, woman and also coupled with that, sometimes brilliant people are not also very hardworking, uh, principled, um, bold and, and audacious in terms of, of her sense of self and really someone who by nature and temperament was not going to take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. So she was able to move into these spaces and into her career in part because of the strength of her own personality and character and temperament, but she always credited her success, and I think she's correct in this, to the generosity and support of older women, older right. uh, Black women, older white women, who at every stage of her career helped make possible the move into the next uh, the next position, particularly as it comes to her training and education. And that was true uh, in how she got to Oxford. She got to Oxford on a scholarship from her Black women's sorority, Alpha, Al Alpha Kappa Alpha, who had established an international study fellowship for uh, their members, and she took advantage of that. Um, and she was able to get to Harvard through the generosity of a woman dean there who saw her potential and helped make a way uh, for her. And I should say also that the women at Oxford, though they were small in number, also took her in and supported her during the three years she was there. So there's that. She also would credit something she calls providence, uh, which in, in, in less um, in religious terms is a kind of serendipity quality. One thing opens when things keep opening for her. And she is definitely someone who takes advantage of every opportunity, um, pounces on it, pursues opportunities, and is very aggressive in that way. So mm -hmm. it's that interesting combination of person, assistance, she would say, uh, providence, um, and also just just the strength of her own um, drive. And what would you say, I mean, what were her, for want of a better word, what were her politics? Well, her politics are actually are really, uh, it's a really great question because I struggled with, with it. And in the end, I resisted labeling her hmm. because I felt like the labels really would not only, they would were too narrow for someone uh, of this, of, of her generation and also of her inclinations. So we, here we have someone who's strongly anti-imperialist, strongly anti-colonial, who had seen the remnants of that system face-to-face uh, -face during uh, a year she spent in India on a Fulbright and through her many uh, travels all around the world. And so in ordinary times, you would call her a radical, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't I don't apply that term to her because I think that at least in this country, that term implies, you know, a certain kind of embrace of um, of Marxism, which mm. she was very familiar with and which she taught and understood, but which she never claimed personally. And you mm. also find that in her generation of scholars, this is someone, as I said, born in 1905. She does live till 1996. That's a whole nother challenge trying to write about someone who lives the full century practically. Um, but I would see her then as 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 a woman, she's trying to figure out what a an educated modern womanhood will look like. What do right. you do with women like her in the 1930s who've made a decision? You know, at some point she remains unmarried and without children. And so she starts to write. Her earliest writings really are about that. How do you educate women 
who have this opportunity to basically fulfill roles traditionally expected of them, but who also can move outside of, of, uh, of the home into professions. And how do you also then train those women to help uplift the race? This is an American term, but to help actually be engaged in work. And so I would say that on all of the political issues, she was a you know, strong supporter of the NAACP, um, you, you know, did lots of work uh, community-based work in, in, in Washington and elsewhere. And so she was in the mainstream of progressive Black politics during her life. Mm-hmm. But when you live from 1905 to 1996, uh, you know, there are periods when you are in your own time politically, there are periods when you're way ahead of your time, and her work consistently is way ahead of its time in terms of its analysis. But then towards the end of your life, I would say in the last quarter century of your life, um, you you know, the, the world moves a little bit beyond where you are. And I think that's one of the challenges in one of, of writing about someone with such a long life. So yeah. I, I have resisted labeling her and as I'm doing that, and my answer is, is reflecting that, um, but I don't find her that much of an outlier from other educated black people of her generation and of her of her training. So, I mean, for example, I have, a month or two ago, I spoke with um, Chad Williams on uh, the life of W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, I, I mean, I wonder if uh, I wonder if there were any um, connections between them They existed in sort of a. Mm-hmm. Similar sorts of time periods, and again, he's a he's an individual who is is very sort of mercurial over time. You know, his um his his politics evolve and evolve, and probably I mean that's probably fair to say about most people in in some regard. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, it do, the answer is often it depends when you get them. Um. And she lives through, obviously, she she is a scholar in the 1930s. She returns to America in the 1940s. She lives through the experience of the Second World War. And she's somebody who's a scholar of diplomacy and international relations. What? How did the Second World War shape her? I mean, what sense did she make of, of that? All right. So you've asked, like, 20 different questions. You know that, <laughs> yeah. you? I'll start with the first one on Du Bois and her and their relationship. And then I'll be very happy to talk about World War II because it's it's actually um it's a really great question. And it's actually a definitive period for her personally and, and in her work. She knew Du Bois, Du Bois knew her. Um and he he actually reviewed her first her first published uh, work in, in the 1940s. This is a book that she wrote on uh, disarmament and and the arms race in which she makes an argument about imperialism uh, and that the the people are gathering uh, armaments and navies, not for self-defense as everybody's saying, but because they need to be able to control and police and acquire colonies, Mm -hmm. which is a really inventive, uh, it's certainly way ahead of the traditional diplomatic history field, international relations at that time. So Du Bois reviews reviews her book, gives it a good, a, a very good review, essentially in the end chides her a little bit for not being as radical as he is, but not in a way that's disrespectful. At other periods in her life, she interacts with him at conferences, uh, at Howard. She defends him when people begin to attack him as being, believe it or not, being old and senile. And she defends him and says, I saw him last week. He's as capable as he's ever been. Um, And so she was a great admirer of Du Bois. How could she not be? I think one of the things that I have tried to do in this book is to especially for scholars of African-American uh, history, is to think about our fields in ways, I'm not trying to decenter Du Bois so much no. as to expand the panoply of folks that we look at when we think about great yes. minds of the 20, of the 20th century. Yeah. And, um, and, in, in, and in some ways there's some, there's some overlap in their work, but she actually has a you know very different um, as you know, set of interests. But you, it's interesting that you raised World War II because part of what I argue in, in this book about her is that she she actually is a child of World War I. Right. And that actually shapes her in one way. And World War II, I think, shapes her in another way, but in ways that are really consistent. And so in World War I, you know, she comes of age 
at a, at a time when she's able to read newspapers and to see what's happening with, with African-Americans here at a time when black soldiers are fighting, uh, you know, on behalf of this country, but suffering through segregation and discrimination, fighting the segregated armed forces. She had older brother, an older brother who served in the Navy and came back uh, home with tales of World War I. And so even as a 16 year old girl in an oratorical contest, she raises all of those issues about the, uh, about the inequalities that, you know, that still exist for, for people who are also serving and fighting and defending this country and who are being patriots. Mm-hmm. So that theme then is just redoubled when World War II comes. Um, and by then, as I said, she's written about disarmament, but she also writes a really, you know, writes compellingly about coupling both World War and World, World War I and World War II about um, the shame of racism and racial inequality in this country as yet again, we call yeah. on black soldiers to go and serve and fight. And, uh, you know, World War II is a period, I think, of intense radicalization for many African-Americans, including those who serve and come back home mm-hmm. uh, because of the opportunity to travel and see um, and, and to also form communities of black people outside of the communities where where folks grew up. So both world wars, one and two, really shaped her um, politically and not just on the domestic front of what's happening with African-Americans here, but she sees both of those wars as part of a longer battle around um, anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. And that kind of brings me to my my next point. So if you look at the the sort of the, the 25 years after the Second World War, Mm-hmm. This is the the kind of uh, colonial, colonialism sunset in a way, or one fate, one v- kind of colonialism sunset. You see, uh, British, French, Belgian um, uh, colonialism uh, across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East go into into rapid retreat. So, where I mean, where was she in? in all of that, um, you know, in, in terms of her, her ideas and, and what she had to say mm-hmm. about it. Well, by the 1970s, she, you know, so much has happened, of course, as she's lived through the civil rights movement, she's lived through desegregation, even though her eyes are on, uh, you know, on, on the world at large. And so once we get through the period of Black power, which affects, and student protests at Howard around uh, issues of of race and any and inequality, her she has shifted by then uh, towards a sort of a final project that she's doing on on Africa, having written about the Pacific, which is the bulk of her the largest corpus of her work is actually about American imperialism in the in the Pacific, primarily through Hawaii. Um, and so, but by the 1970s, she shifted to Africa. And even in this age of, of decolonization or of empires falling or being renamed or recalled, or she is really concerned about corp- what I, I call them, and she called corporate imperialism. That is right. the power of international corporations in Africa. Right. And very specifically, she's interested in railroads and deep seaports and mineral extraction right. and the ways that the colonial railways in Africa first built in Egypt, actually, but then, you know, throughout the uh, the continent are, uh, are as, as she says, they're, they, they become as powerful as armaments, as tools of imperialism. Yeah. And so she's trying to trace not only the early colonial railways, but all the new railways that are built in the 1970s and the deep, deep sea ports, particularly in, in southern and eastern uh, Africa, yeah. that are that are that she sees as as a real threat to the future of an independent Africa, and really um, begins to envision what we then see, you know, so you know so clearly uh, in the in the centuries that follow uh and so that's what she's working on at the at you know at the end of her life she sees yeah. railroad railways as as she calls them the sinews and arteries of empire that's right. the name of one of the projects that she's working on and it's a really interesting project uh which she was not able to bring to print but i've been able to cobble together arguments and her approach to it yeah 
And she had originally envisioned it as a trans-imperial project. That is that she would not just look at British railways, but although the British are particularly good at it, as you may know, um, but at other, um, you know, at, at American corporations who are right there, you know, as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so that brings to, together her interest in both travel and in Africa, but she's also always been kind of um, mechanically incli inclined or very right. comfortable with, with engin engineering and, and all of that and, um, and very detail oriented and was able to gather a tremendous amount of material from the corporations themselves, okay. unsuspecting for them um, to produce this work. So in that way, she's, you know, she's she's actually looking ahead into mm. post-independent uh, Africa. And she almost seems to have the mind almost of the investigative journalist there. Um she she does and it's but it's coupled with uh she's an archive hound of i mean she's someone who is both very comfortable with detail to an excessive amount at some point i say that as someone who had to read everything she wrote um but it's in the that she believes that the story is actually in the details and that if you're going to understand what's really happening in that moment you need to understand Alcoa and you need to understand other aluminum uh, uh, manufacturers and the connections, uh, particularly um, that she sees between those corporations and the continued exploitation of indigenous black labor in yeah. Africa. Would she have had a particular interest in, say, Congo? Um, she did. Um, it's um, interesting that you should say that her most of her focus actually is on South Africa and right. the and the the ports along that side. But she does write about the Congo um, in a in a research paper, and she uses it to show the involvement of American industrialists and entrepreneurs in in the Congo uh, in the in that period. And that was a standalone work that she delivered at a at a conference. Actually, a couple. I think that was on. Iron ore, if I'm not correct, it's it's mm -hmm. tied to a particular industry. But she's on, but that's what she uses that to say. We can't just blame the Belgians. We're there too. Yeah, yeah. So that so in that time, I mean, when she was sort of drawing these connections, um, as kind of a, a, a official kind of empires withdraw, and you get these sort of rather more opaque, invisible. Uh, empires of um, economic extraction, um, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't. I don't really kind of call them trade because that's a rather sort of rather mis. That's a, a bit of a mm -hmm. euphemism. Um, but the, the, it, 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 this this kind of neo colonialism. Were there many people in the field at the time making these sorts of points, or is she kind of the trailblazer? He's a trailblazer and it gets picked up much later and gets to be called and it's renamed something else. But that work, when she's doing it, no one is really looking at it in that way. And I think this is actually true of all of her work is yeah. that the field catches up with her down the road. Um, but she's there early, certainly in diplomatic history and international relations in the U.S., um, the field turns towards uh, something that looks more like a critique of imperialism, but really much later in the, like mm. in the in the mid to late 1970s, I would say, or even yeah. beyond that. And so she's already there um, and she's old. She lives long enough to begin to write reviews about that younger generation. And she congratulates them yeah. and ch chides them in a backhanded way uh, to basically say, you know, welcome to my world. Uh, yes, this is what we need to be thinking about. And I think I think those ideas become mainstream. I mean, the the it's pretty much received wisdom now, but those ideas become mainstream probably as late as the nineteen nineties when you're talking about and you know anti global the beginnings of anti globalization movements and, and and that kind of thing. This is where they become almost sort of you know uh, pop popularized. Well, when we move into the use of the term globalization to mean all sorts of things, I think that you're right that I would pin it to the later period. But I, I do think, at least in this country, there's a great deal, especially in African-American politics and among Af African-American 
progressive thinkers and organizers. Remember the Free South Africa movement erupts. Yes. Well, it doesn't really erupt. It's there. But it's even there in this period, but it really takes moves into a different um, gear, if you will, in the 1980s, where it's a much more. But the identification of African Americans with the plight of of workers and people and uh, what was then Rhodesia and then South Africa uh, and elsewhere is, uh, it, you know, is particularly strong and is and actually is present throughout the, you know, throughout the century. But um, so I would also say that the, that in the fields of diplomatic history, international relations, um, attention to race and therefore and or to Africa and 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 what you call sort of neocolonialism, it comes later. The field of African American history is there is there from its genesis yeah. so to speak so see, it's you're right about it being mainstream but let's not forget that yeah. there is actually a very virulent minority that's been saying that for a hundred years yeah and i suppose that i mean in the uh, in in this this is this, this the, the the black power era of of the, the, the civil rights movement you have people vocally people like stokely carmichael saying you know there's a there is a connection between how Southern uh, black people are treated, and the way that people in, uh, you know, Africans are are treated. These things, like, these things, aren't a coincidence, um, and and they are part of a a, a wider struggle for emancipation. And they're making those those sorts of observations. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting period because it's funny that you mentioned. Um, uh, Carmichael because he was a student at Howard and actually was part of the the not and it was from Howard that he went you know uh, south uh, was uh, to to do organizing there but there had been these these uh, these student protests at Howard uh, wanting the curriculum to be reorganized to te- have more teaching about Africa and, imper- and imperialism um, and though she disagreed with the tactics. Uh, that because it it's because that kind of protest is if you're a teacher and if you're on faculty is disruptive you know students can't get the class all that she's thinking as a teacher but in fact she says she literally says if you can't beat them you might as well join them and so she begins to offer a new course on imperialism in Africa to right. those students and uses it as a place for them to come and learn and talk and and basically to be able to to finesse their own understandings of what's happening there. And uh, so that's, an, a, a, I guess, an example of her basically moving along with the times. But in some ways, she would also say that the times, um, you know, caught up with her, too, mm-hmm. because she had been actually writing about um, about South, about Africa and, and imperialism for a long time. Right. And um so in the, the 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 final years of her life, when did she when did she retire from academia? She, she retires in nineteen seventy seven, but lives until nineteen ninety six, and so um, she, and in, in, and in that twenty year period after she retires, that's when she is still working on the. Uh, the project on Africa, but she's also working at that time, and this and this does get published on um, imperialism, as I said, in in the Pacific. But she actually begins to look at the way at the at the at the inclinations of Australia and New Zealand vis-a-vis their smaller, more vulnerable neighbor islands, and really writes about a wide variety of of of, uh, of ideas. And tensions in south in the Southwest uh, Pacific. She writes about the U.S. Um, detonating atomic and t- doing uh, atomic weapon uh, testing in that region, which is often overlooked. Mm-hmm. Um, but she is is um, you know, and she's very committed to highlighting the presence and the continued exploitation of indigenous people in that region yeah. uh, as well. So she's she's juggling both the work on on the on the remaining work on the Southwest Pacific and then this work on Africa. And you know, as as far as the kind of uh, to use a very very broad term, the, the establishment view her. Uh, was was she a kind of a, a, a dissident academic, or was, she, was her? Does she have any influence in things like the State Department, or was she largely ignored? She was. She sought and would have liked to have been treated as the expert she was, particularly on disarmament, by the State Department. And there were attempts by her and others 
to have her become involved in some of the work that was happening there. That did not happen. Um, but well, she was involved in UNESCO mm-hmm. and uh, UNESCO uh, projects in the nineteen in the late nineteen forty eight. You know, after the the UN's uh, formation. And for them, she writes about, uh, you know, it, it, she writes about atomic, uh, the, the, the particular dangers in the post-World War II world of atomic weapons, and particularly after the United States uh, deployed them. And that is, is what she brings to, you know, to that discussion. But if you look at the careers of other African-American um, intellectuals who were trained in similar ways, and the, the one who comes to mind would be Ralph Bunch of course, who is then drawn into, you know, first OSS and then becomes a part of of UN efforts. Those opportunities uh, did not come her way. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I can't judge that. But I think at the time she would have, she would have welcomed it, though she was such a bold thinker. It's difficult for me to imagine her following any company line, even the, even the company line is that of the United States. She's such an independent thinker and not someone who took to being told or prescribed. And so um, I think in the in the long run, it was um, it, that worked out all right for her. Well, every every great careerist needs to know how to play the game, don't they? You know, um... well, I wouldn't so much say she was. Yes. Yes, you're talking about bunch. I hope uh, wow, not yeah. about yes, not yeah, Tate. Not yes. about her. No, no yeah, thank you. No. Well, there we must draw to a close. But it's been um, a delight to to talk today, and uh, there's so much more to I think to 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 discuss um, around all of the the, the multiplicity of, of things that have come up today. So I do hope you'll you'll pop back in the future, and and perhaps we can. Uh, I'd be delighted to. Yeah, we can. We'll be happy. um, And as you know, as ideas come up, but thank you so much. And this, you know, the book, um, you know, Merce Tate, The Global Odyssey of a Black Woman Scholar uh, comes out here next week. It comes out in the UK in February. Wow. Okay. So my my annual, my my, not annual, but my my regular uh, kind of uh, shout out um to everyone. This this is obviously a, um, a, a great addition to uh, any any bookshelf do if you're going to purchase it try to support your independent book retailer um, because they are part of a, a whole ecosystem of knowledge that once it's being crushed by amazon won't be coming back so let's support those guys please please do um fan- fantastic so barbara it's been a real pleasure and um, we'll finish that and okay. um, Good luck with the book, and I hope to chat again. Yes, I look forward to it, and thank you so much again for all the good work that you're doing um, and, and reaching people in this in this way and making a really productive use of this media form. Not always the case. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. All the best. <laughs>